So last week I shared about Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman at the well. And I shared two points. I made two points. One is that she was excited about her encounter with Jesus. And in that excitement, she went and she shared just a little that she knew. She was even uncertain about that little that she knew, but even then she went and shared it. And the result was many in the village, town, not there. Many in the village or town came to know her, came to know Jesus as the Messiah. Okay? Um, so testifying to whatever we've experienced, no matter how little, being excited about what Jesus has, about Jesus, what he's done in our lives. That is, those are the two points that I left you all with. And um, I also gave you the example of Samuel, who's come a couple of times to church, who's come once for camp, and then who went and invited 24 people from Chathitkar for camp, and 11 booked their tickets. And the sad news is that they've all had to cancel because his grandfather's in hospital having operation on the 9th of November and so they can't come. It doesn't change the fact of his excitement and what he did and I'm rather depressed because that's been the first point of prayer for camp and I'm wondering if that didn't get answered, will nothing else get answered? All the points of prayer we prayed so I've got to really keep my faith and trust up. Okay? After the sermon in the afternoon, I was accosted by two members, two young members of our church <laughs> with, with, with uh, uh, open, open air quotes, yeah, that's what they call air quotes, feedback. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, I want to share a couple of things from that before I proceed. One is that Rahil reminded me that, and it was a good story, because what was my point that if you're excited about something and you just share the little that you have, she shared how the whole th thread of women at the well type testimonies that led to Samuel coming to church, okay? And I thought that was an important, because it's an encouraging for us, encouraging thing for us that you can do so little and it can make such, it can have such a big impact. So she shared how uh, Anila and I would go to MSUW and take the Bible study and Ryle happened to be a student for just one year and then after that she came to All Saints because of Rebecca I suppose yeah I mean auntie and whatever and met us and then she came for contemporary service okay and then when her friend lost her mother was it? Just before that was not, I mean, a friend who was not a Christian was not feeling, was sort of in a bad state. She invited her to church and that friend came just for one service. Then that friend happened to go to Pune. Neston went to friend's house. And that friend told Neston, oh, I went to this church and there was such a nice service. That's it. And the Neston... Then that's what I mean. They're just saying one one line. These people. The Neston comes to All Saints all the way from Pune. He goes back. Tells Prema about it. Prema comes to All Saints. She go, keeps going back and forth and getting people one by one. One of the people she got was Parish, and Parish tells Samuel, and Samuel comes. So the whole point is that none of these people were theologians with great, uh, you know, the gospel was not proclaimed in all of these cases. But one by one, just what, what, they, what, what they were excited about, they shared with the next person. Yeah? So that was one thing. Just to be encouraged, that's how, that's how small and simple it can be. Okay? The next uh, challenge was given by Akshay, which was, what if you are not excited? What if you are not all like Rahel? That was the basic point. You know, she gets excited pretty easily. And a lot of us don't get so excited so easily including Akshay. So he said, if I'm not excited, what to do? And of course he's right. Fake excitement is both counterproductive and unproductive. Okay? Because it puts undue pressure on you to be excited about something which you're not excited about. Okay? It also results in inauthentic witness. Because, you know, 
and actually what it results is in formula somebody is excited about something they make a they share it in a certain way and then they make a formula out of it and then they tell everybody else use this formula it worked for me it only worked for them because they were excited it wasn't the formula yeah and then we use the formula without excitement so the point is if you're not excited do you not tell okay so we want to be excited we want to ask god to give us excitement something is wrong because we all get excited about something or the other so how do we not get excited about the most amazing thing in our lives but let's put that aside we are some people are like that okay a lot of us are like that i want to share another thing that we can do which will also help us to tell others and we can pray for that and a lot of us don't have that either and it's almost the opposite of excitement it's burden excitement can lead you to tell people about jesus but so can a burden so to start with i want to show you a small 5 minute video okay and then i'll share a couple of things and we'll end with another 1 minute video okay this video is and for the guys online anila is okay we'll we'll just keep streaming it so if you can hear it that's also fine but you can watch it online okay it's called the moravians missionaries and prayer warriors it's a small 5 minute video and you may know about the moravians but you'll anyway learn about them through the video so let's watch it and then i'll come back and share some more when we think about the modern protestant missions movement it's typical for historians to trace it back to one william carey a baptist missionary to india at the beginning of the 19th century carey has indeed been dubbed the father of modern missions while carey did much to advance the modern missions movement carey's own inspiration was a group of 300 young radicals from germany who dedicated themselves to carry out the great commission a full generation before sent from europe to the furthest reaches of the globe these young moravian men and women led by a rich young ruler count nicholas von zinzendorf didn't need the usual titles and prestige of clergy in fact they would even sell themselves into slavery simply to reach those who had not heard the name of Jesus their watchword was that the lamb who was slain would receive the reward of his suffering their sacrifice their love and their passion not only changed the hardest and the darkest places on the earth but they became an inspiration to the next generation to passionately fulfill the command of their master and their story continues to inspire thousands today but what provoked and fueled such devotion what was the fire behind their missionary abandonment on august 13th 1727 Zinzendorf enthusiastically described a day of outpourings of the Holy Spirit upon the community. It was its Pentecost. Within 2 weeks of this Holy Spirit outpouring, 24 men and 24 women covenanted to hourly intercessions and thus pray every hour around the clock. They were committed to see that the fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. The numbers committed soon increased to around 70. While relatively few in number, this prayer meeting would go non-stop for the next 100 years. The fire did not go out in the Moravian community of Hernhut for several generations. For many, this continuous prayer meeting is seen as the spiritual power behind the subsequent impact that the Moravians had upon the world. For not only did the Moravian missionary movement have profound impact itself, but the Moravian impact upon the young Anglican by the name of John Wesley saw an unprecedented move of God on both sides of the Atlantic through the Methodist movement. Today many look to the Moravians for inspiration. A worldwide prayer movement is beginning to stir with day and night prayer being raised up through 24/7 houses of prayer, prayer watches, solemn assemblies and days of prayer all across the globe. While at the same time A new missions movement is being provoked to go to the hardest and darkest places of the earth to finish the task of preaching the gospel to every tribe and tongue. When the Moravians, the first Protestant mission, 
began their ministry. They began it in the place of prayer, praying for the nations 24-7. And I believe there that model that God used Zinzendorf to establish has been an inspiration to so many houses of prayer across the earth, even in this hour of history. I believe the Moravian movement is the model, community, covenant love, living in unity together, corporate fasting and prayer, and loosing the great missions and harvest movement at the end of the age. That's what we're after. We're after what Count Zinzendorf did, seeing night and day prayer connected to the global mandate to preach Jesus in every nation. What is even more miraculous is that both streams see themselves now as part of the same movement, missions and prayer, working together in concert to finish the Great Commission. Jesus told us to pray because the harvest is great. And he told us to go and make disciples. As the church, we must do both together. And that is why many at this hour of history are looking to this group of 300 young German radicals who gave themselves to a life of prayer and went into all the world. They lived a life of prayer on a mission. Wasn't that amazing, that story? How many of you heard of this? These chaps before? Only Karen and Anne. Carol was one of the founders of the 1727 prayer time. Wow. So the thing that actually struck me, because I, I sort of knew about the Moravians more about their hundred-year prayer meeting. I know that they had a hundred-year prayer meeting. I did not realize also that they were that mission was such a key part of what they did. And you know, God has this year especially really been speaking to us about prayer more than speaking to us, pushing us into prayer, connecting us with people like MT and who are trying to do the same thing and we've had that that 24 hour prayer last month we had another one the month before and when you hear these guys you feel you know 24 24 48 of them could do that and we know we have hundreds of thousands of uh, Christians in the city why aren't we able to do a 24 hour 24 7 prayer but the point is this, and that's the connection that I realized, was that prayer is what led to the mission. Because prayer led to God's burden on their hearts. They got together and they prayed and they just kept praying and a burden came on their hearts which was then released in mission. And this clear connection between prayer and mission. We've been speaking about prayer and revival. But also prayer and mission I'm seeing today and of course it's all interlinked. When revival happens, mission also happens. And so I think I could see the connection when I saw this video with what I shared last week, that even as God has been calling us deeper into prayer, He is calling us to be more urgent and to be more intentional, intentional about reaching the lost. And I said that excitement is what should fuel us into mission. Okay. But also burden. And what I see with the Moravians, I, I don't see excitement there. But I see a deep burden for the lost. Okay. I want to share with you the example of Paul as an example of somebody with a burden. Okay. Romans 9 verses 1 to 3. I'll read it out. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race. Okay. In Romans chapter 9, 8 onwards, actually chapter 9 especially, he's, 
he is burdened for the Jews who have rejected the Messiah. He is burdened for their salvation. Okay. And he describes it this way. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish. For their present state, they don't know Jesus as well as for what awaits them. And he makes this amazing statement that I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ. What Paul is saying is he's even willing to suffer hell for all eternity if it will result in the salvation of his people. That's what Paul is saying. And in doing so, of course, he's echoing Moses in Exodus 32 verse 32. When Moses goes and pleads for the people after the golden calf incident, he says, but now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. No? And of course, God says nothing doing. You are in the book and he forgives them, but he does punish them. But the point is, just see the, see the burden that these two leaders had for their people. Both loved their people so much and in both cases there were people who were persecuting them, who were troubling them. You know? Nobody could, would blame Moses for saying enough, God get rid of these people. And when God said I'm getting rid of them, thank you God. You know, Paul was being persecuted continually by the Jews and yet they had such a burden for them that they were willing for their own salvation for their own relationship with Jesus to be destroyed in order to save them. You know? This is the kind of burden they had for their people. How much do we love our loved ones? What kind of burden do we have for their salvation? Leave alone strangers. I mean the whole mission thing is about people you don't know. Missionaries going to the ends of the earth. You know the other day I think Anila sent me some forward about this, uh, where is she gone? Huh? Some Anglican, some, uh, some prisoner on death row in England and the priest goes to counsel him on the last, I mean the last morning he is going to be hung or whatever and tells him about Jesus and tells him about hell, you know, that, that, you know if you are not, if you don't repent you are going to hell and that prisoner turns around and tells uh, the priest that if you believed what you are telling me or what, what, what is it if I believed? If you believe what you are telling me about hell or if I believe what you were telling me about hell I would be going on my knees on broken glass to the ends of the country telling people about Jesus. Okay, And it was it was meant, I mean, it was convicting for the priest maybe and we think that, oh yeah, if you do believe it. But I also thought, it struck me that that man, that prisoner, when he comes before Jesus, he can, can't say that, but you know, your people were not really committed. Because the reality is, is that we have an incredible witness of missionaries across the world. Across the centuries, right from Paul and the early church onward. People have gone to the ends of the earth to tell people about Jesus. You know, nobody can. I mean, at least no Westerner could ever say that I don't know about it because you can see it. It's all. It's all around. I remember reading stories of these missionaries who would take their belongings in a coffin. They would not carry suitcases. They would carry coffins so that that same coffin could be used to send their body back when they died on the mission field. That was, that was the commitment. We, they were going and they were not coming back except in a coffin. Paul and Moses both had that kind of burden. I'm reading one more verse that Paul, you know, how did he work out this burden that he had? Okay? 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 22. So Paul writes, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. 
to those not having the law, which means the Gentiles, I become like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I become weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. He was willing to do anything for the lost. Willing to give up his rights and privileges for them. And he says, in effect, he has made himself a slave to this burden. So I become a slave in order to see them. And if you, I don't know if you just caught that little bit in the Moravian thing, that they even sold themselves as slaves. I mean, can you imagine that? What a burden, what commitment, what, what a certainty that this life is nothing compared to eternity. And yet we live as if this life is everything. As if the things that we do, the things that we have, the relationships, the, the work, the whatever, as if it's everything, as if it's the most important thing. And it's just compared to eternity. And that's what Paul is saying. He says, I can enjoy all these things. I am choosing not to. You know, they won't, technically there won't be meat in heaven because there will be no death. No meat, something has to die to have meat. So I am sure that the fruit will also taste like chicken and pork and all that. <laughs> God will give us things to enjoy, you know, why not? Hmm? Yeah. No, we don't eat, I know that, but I'm just saying that it's going to be much better than here on earth, obviously. Okay? And so whether we look at the Moravians, the burden that they had, we look at Paul, what he was willing to do with that burden. Okay? My point is, let's pray for excitement, let's pray for burden, but let's pray. So whatever, whatever will cause us to act. Whatever will get you and me out of this paralysis, out of this inertia, this lethargy, this complete complacency, this indifference to the to the destiny of our loved ones. Forget about the strangers on the street to whom go and make disciples of all nations. But our loved ones, our family, our friends, our neighborhood, our city. So I'm going to show you another small video. This is actually uh, the ones that came to Nightwatch will have seen this. It's a one minute video. It was an it was an ad for a prayer gathering. But now I said it no. Yeah. I saw it was quite quite correct actually. Hmm? So we'll just watch this one minute clip and then let's keep a period uh, a time of silence and allow allow God's word to sink in. Okay. It's time for change. It's time for the healing of our land. It's time for the body of Christ to unite in prayer for a spiritual revolution. It's time for us to repent and forgive one another. It's time for unity and spirit and truth. It's time for God to do a new thing. It's time for demonstrations of supernatural power. It's time to push back the darkness. It's time for every valley to be exalted and every mountain and hill to be made low. It's time for crooked places to be made straight and rough places plain. It's time to make a highway for our God. It's time for him to come. It's time to pray. And let us close our eyes. And again today I was amazed at how uh, God ordered the worship and this word when I chose the song Prepare the Way. And of course it didn't know and as we were worshipping I realized that the reference was the same as this little clip.
We invite you to come, Holy Spirit, come afresh. Forgive us our lack of excitement. Forgive us our lack of burden. But Lord, we know neither of those things can we manufacture or imitate. And so today, the best that we know how we come to you, offer ourselves afresh and say, give us your burden. Give us your burden for the lost. And we know, Lord, it's been time for, for a very long time now that you've been calling us to the city and nation. Maybe respond, Lord. Today, maybe respond. As the verse says, today, maybe not hard in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you will stir every person here, Lord, to go deeper into prayer. And in that place of prayer, Lord, may we receive your burden for the lost. May we sense your urgency. May we believe in the truth of your word and act accordingly, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name.